Um, I submitted all those A numbers earlier today, so you should have gotten an invite. Uh, if not, you can check your email, you should have an invite to that Canvas course. So if you haven't seen that, I, those are all the applications that I have. Um, I know Barb has signed a few, so we'll figure out either you've got it, get it to me, or if she's got it, just go pick it back up so I can get it and invite you to that course. Um, the other thing is I've got... Um, Flyers that I'm going to leave in the back of the room so you can pick one up on your way out if you're interested. But this is for that Nepal trip this summer. Uh, so headed to Nepal, Nepal to the Kathmandu Valley uh, where they do a lot of uh, overseas manufacturing there. So a lot of apparel and textiles and that type of gear. Um, spend two weeks there basically. We'll go and see a bunch of factories. Um, see how things are processed, see what third world type conditions are in those factories. Um, the idea is that hopefully we'll also have uh, one of the professors from industrial hygiene along with us that will talk more to the safety standards and all the issues that are involved um, in trying to make factories better for fair trade or better working conditions, things like that. There will also be a service aspect because we'll also be going along with the um, youth clinic, we also put on these events, and so we'll be doing service in some of the remote villages, helping to educate um, uh, adults there, and working with kids, um, teaching them sewing skills, construction skills, design skills, things like that. Um, and then finishing it off, again, the last three days with a uh, three-day trek through the valley, a bunch of scenic vistas of Everest. Um, I'm still waiting for Ryan Taylor, who I've been working with on this, to give you pricing for then sending you to base camp if you want to extend the adventure. I don't know what that cost would look like. Um, so I think the final cost came in just under $4,000. Uh, it gets you two credits of OPD 3900, which counts towards Upper Division Tech Elective. Um, so, Applications are due in the very beginning of February, but the sooner you can get them in, the better. Basically, they just have a set number. If you don't hit that set number for these trips, then they just cancel the trip. Uh, so we just want to see if we've got the interest level uh, on. So like I said, if you need more information, let me know or come talk to me. Um, I'll probably have Ryan Taylor come up and give you more information. He's done several of these. Um, when he was a student in the program, and so we'll have that. But I'll just post these in the back uh, there so you can grab one as you're leaving. And then uh, let's see, I finished that. Do we have any other? I think we're good, right? Okay, um, so we've got Chris with us today. I'm doing a panorama. Be still. Don't move. Proof to my conscience of just cutting more. Uh, Proof to my wife that I have my classes. Oh, there we go. I teach all these kids sketching at the same time. Uh, so, Chris, uh, I'll let him introduce himself a little bit more. but. Some of you probably had him uh, for sketching. So Chris was our adjunct last year that started off teaching sketching, and now we've got several other instructors along with us. Um, but he's here to kind of talk about portfolio from a professional standpoint, um, things that you might want to look for, tips and tricks, uh, kind of teaching to the professional level of it, but things that can be integrated into your portfolio. And so he'll talk to you, and then we'll leave some time for questions. And Oh, 
sorry. I've got the clicker open so you can just click over. I'm sure. Okay, does that, does that amplify my voice now? Okay, is that good? You good? Okay. Um, my name is Chris Nascimento. Uh, I see some of my students here. Great. They're scattered. I'm not used to seeing them out of place. So, um, but good to be here. I uh, I'm an industrial designer. I went to BYU, uh, studied industrial design, and I've worked in several different industries over my career. Uh, and I've been kind of fortunate that way. I wouldn't suggest that you build your portfolios for a variety of different things, okay? Um, or different avenues. You kind of gotta pick something you really enjoy and focus on that, okay? So if you want to do backpacks, don't have sketches of bicycles. Okay, you should have lots of backpack sketches and lots of stuff. Lots of content for that. But anyway, okay, so before I get into the details, I do want you guys to think of questions you have because I want to answer questions. I don't want to just sit up here and talk for, you know, 45 minutes. I don't know if I could talk about portfolio for 45 minutes, but um, uh, I'll give you a quick snapshot of what I've done after I went to school. At BYU, I went out to Michigan, worked in the automotive industry. And I, I was sketching like car interior products and stuff like that, and seats and consoles and things like that. Uh, and then we got tired of Michigan. No offense to anyone who's from Michigan, maybe, but we just didn't like how it was too fat and there's no mountains there. So we came back to Utah, uh, worked for a bag company for a few, not very long, about six months. Worked on golf bag products and backpacks, stuff like that. And then uh, went out to Portland and uh, was hired by Nike and worked for Nike for about four years. And then and I did equipment at Nike, so I did like plastics for baseball equipment, catchers, helmets and catchers gear, stuff like that. Um, a lot of gloves. And then I went to Columbia and did footwear, so I did hiking boots and a whole bunch of winter boots and stuff like that. Um, then after Columbia, Freelance for a little while, did some medical products, okay. Got really good at solid work, started using that a lot more in my process. Um, and then uh, came to Icon, so I'm at Icon. And then I'm teaching as well, so teaching a sketch class. Um, okay, so that's a snapshot on me. Okay, so you guys want to know about what you need to do to get a job, right? Like, what do I need to do to prepare to get a job? Okay? What does my portfolio need to have? What type of content? What are employers looking for, okay? So I, I brought this website up because the best way you can learn how to present your ideas is to go to industrial design firms' websites. Okay, why? Because each one of these projects they have is a portfolio piece that they're presenting to a potential client that they're trying to get work from, okay? So here's your, Here's your recipe, right? You go, cool photo, love it, okay? I'm gonna talk about a couple other things with LinkedIn and, and all that stuff and having your own website. But here's how they present their idea. <coughs> These guys are really good. Follow, go to websites, go to industrial design. You saw me search, I was searching uh, industrial design websites. <coughs> And so I go to Google and go industrial design firms. Okay. And then just start scrolling down. I'm on Bressler right now. You know, you can go to, <coughs> I don't recognize any of those, but um, find some other ones that are here. You know, you can go to the big ones. You can go to like, you know, IDO and RKS is a good one. They've been around for quite a while there in, in LA area but there's no there's no reason to reinvent or try and recreate or invent how you need to present your stuff okay um, there you can use a formula you can use a formula that these other people are using these design firms are using okay so that's that's one thing I would suggest is to go to these websites and say how do they communicate the idea 
Well, they have a beautiful photo, you know, rendering. That's a photo of a product. This is a rendering. There's a quick summary right here. Swimmers have different needs than runners and cyclists. So it's a problem statement, right? And then the founders of Flex envision a fitness tracker for swimmers by swimmers. Okay, then there's a quick summary of here's what we've, we've what we're thinking. And then this is probably a, a, a solution statement, okay? So problem, state the problem. So in each project you have. So let's say by the time you graduate, you have, you know, six or seven projects. I don't know, how many will they usually have? About that. About that. Six or seven projects that are, are worthy, okay, of being shown in your portfolio, right? So here's a couple of cautions. And I hope you guys are taking notes on, on the important things. So uh, don't put your bad sketches in your portfolio. Okay. <laughs> your own your portfolio is only you may have heard this before is only as strong as your worst sketch or your worst project. If you have a really home a home run project, a hero project that uh, has been received well and it's thoughtful and your peers have evaluated, your professors have evaluated, so yeah, this is a good, good solution. Even some industry people have come in and looked at it. Those are things you want to put in. Now, if you only have one of those, obviously you've got to have more work, that's fine. But when it comes to your sketching and ideating, keep out the bad stuff, okay? So, something we do a lot, or we used to do a lot, is after you design the product, you can actually go back and re-sketch it. It's okay. Because then you have a 3D model and you can sketch a little bit better. So I would suggest um, doing your sketches, redoing some of your sketches, okay, before you present it with your project. Okay? So that's important. Alright. Um, okay, so keep out the bad stuff. All right, but, okay, so you don't need to really reinvent. Okay, come to these websites, look how they have a problem statement. Okay. Here was the problem. You must have that. You can't just have some, I uh, wanted to just redesign a um, cell phone case, you know, just for a styling exercise. Okay, that's fine, but I wouldn't use a cell phone case as a styling exercise. I'd use something a little more sexy, okay? Um, but you want to have some substance. So there should be something you're trying to solve, some problem you're trying to solve, okay? So that's super important. Um, your portfolio, your pieces are the projects you're working on. Designers are trying to create a rational change in behavior. Okay, that's what, when you make a product, you're trying to get someone to behave differently. You're trying to convince them to behave differently, to experience something differently. You're, you're, you're going, hey, I'd use the remote or whatever. Is this yours? Yes. Oh, okay. What, what is this? It's an eye clicker. An eye clicker? What's an eye clicker? <laughs> oh. oh. Okay, cool. Okay, so it's an attendance thing. Um, Try it. So you want someone to use these buttons different, or maybe it's a scroll wheel or whatever, okay? Uh, there's some, some treadmills out there that competitors trust that use little dials instead of buttons, okay? That's a new experience they're giving a consumer, okay? Is it a rational change in behavior to do that? Or is it irrational? Okay, so think about rational, irrational. As you design your portfolio pieces, you work on your projects, okay? Is it irrational that we have, um, you know, uh, there's so many different, you know, you want to create a new transit system across the city and it requires cabling and stuff like that and high wire. Well, okay, it's kind of cool. You get above traffic. This is actually a, um, a project that one of my uh, friends at BYU did when he was a student, when we were students. And, but it required ridiculous amounts of infrastructure to build all these things in the city. So that's irrational, okay? And it's cost prohibitive. So think of what's rational, okay? It's not rational to drive hovercrafts to work. Are they innovative? Are they cool? I think innovation is <coughs> rationality to it. It's important to be sensible, okay? And you have to make projects for companies. So what's a company looking for in their portfolio? Can the product that they're proposing, can it attract a certain demographic 
Okay? So you must know who your consumer is. This is something I write down. You gotta know who the consumer is. You must know your consumer. Who are you going after, right? So I put that in your portfolio, okay, in all your projects. That's super important, okay? Problem statement, who your consumer is, okay? Uh, you should have some trend things in there, styling, some image, uh, or sorry, uh, uh, what's the word? Inspiration. Inspiration imagery, okay, that's important to have in there. Um, okay. Any questions up to this point? You guys can interject, yes? Do you have like an example of inspiration imaging of new boards? Yeah, so what I do, I have a Pinterest mm -hmm. board, right? And I just, I, if I see something cool, I mean, you can just save the Pinterest, save the Pinterest, right? And so I've got a, a Pinterest board that's like a Mont Blanc of all the sorts of cool stuff that I use. I don't use it to, to pitch ideas to people anymore mm -hmm. or to get a job. It's to inspire me on to what I want the forms to look like and the aesthetics. Okay. Uh, good question. Good question. Okay, so uh, help me keep on track here. We go back to this. Use these guys. Follow the, the format. You'll see. You'll see. You'll start to see a pattern. Problem statement. Here's our research we did. Here's our consumer. Uh, and then here's our solution. And here's our ideas. And here's how we got from point A to point B. So this is really important. I know a lot of employers want to see this. They want to see how you got to your final idea. Okay. So show some evolution. So this is something I write down. Show us an evolution of how you got from this design to this design. Because you can never start out with the solution. You just can't. It's impossible. You might get lucky. But it's very difficult. You're going to go through iteration after iteration after iteration. Now, you don't need to show 30 iterations. You know, but show a, a definite, here's the start, and here's how it morphed into this final solution. So it's good to show the steps that you take as you build the workflow. Okay. Uh, question? Yes, go ahead. How, how important is product validation? Uh, how do you do that as an individual? Uh, what is product validation? So it shows like <laughs> you want to validate like what part of it? Is there a market for it? Right. Like, okay. Is there gotcha, like gotcha. a need okay. market? Okay, that's a good question. So. Um, you know, that's, I wouldn't say that's a focal point that companies are looking for, because that's really not our job as industrial designers. Our, our, design, our job is to, to pitch the things that no one else is, is too scared to pitch, that people are too scared to pitch, right? That we, we should be breaking the boundaries and, and, and thinking way outside the box and going, hey, we do it this way, but what if we did it this way, okay? So, that's another thing as you build your portfolio. Here's the current, here's the new, and um, I would also throw in there, ex like you're trying to create a new experience, right? So, there's, there's product new function, okay? But it's really a new experience. Why do most of the students in here have apples? Because it's experience, right? I'm, I'm just kind of looking at this like most people are apples in there. I know you most, most of you probably have iPhones for sure, okay? And it's because of the experience that they give you and how it makes you feel, right? And you feel cool, you know, and it's like, I got the X. Yes, I'm leasing it because I can't afford the payment. And that's a, it's a pay cash for it, but that's okay. I got my iPhone, okay? Um, uh, so, okay, so, as far as your content, okay, just make sure you tell a story. This is another important thing. I, you know, I don't know, like Nike and some of these other companies are all in, like the footwear companies are really into storytelling, okay? And so like, what's the story? Why Why are you making the shoe look like this or whatever? And so you gotta, but you can't have a story without a problem, okay? And so that story evolves from the problem statement. And the problem statement is your, it's your North Star. It's the thing that guides you, okay? At GM, they call it the single mission challenge, okay? So we're doing some new project. What's the single mission challenge? The, on the new tailgate on the trucks that 
you know, it's a dual tailgate. The single mission challenge was we need a functional tailgate that's more, you know, more functional, more versatile. Okay. You guys know what I'm talking about? That tailgate that kind of, there's a little mini guy that you can step up to. It's kind of cool. Um, okay, so there's a single mission challenge. So for every project. Okay. Um, okay, so that's, again, to, to recap, go through these websites, look at how other people are doing it, design firms specifically. Because they have to, they have, look, we, we, we are, the problem right now with our society is we can't pay attention for very long, okay? You need to hit us quick and fast and hard and impactful very fast, right? So they can't write 10 paragraphs. They probably want to, and they probably could. It's gotta be very short, very concise. Brevity, brevity, okay? Um, so use brevity. Okay, learn from the masters. Go to these guys. And there's a thousand of them out there, okay? See how they do it, okay. Uh, I wanted to talk about the types of fonts you should use, the graphics, and stuff like that, okay? Because I'm sure you probably have questions about that. So, rule number one, don't use an aerial font, okay? Just don't use aerial. Don't use Helvetica. <laughs> don't, use, don't use any of those generic word perfect fonts, okay? Um, research, uh, I'm not gonna tell you specific fonts to use, but don't use those, okay? And don't use bold fonts, don't use italicized fonts. Use the fonts that these guys are using on the website, okay? Find out what they are, okay? If you have an Adobe or Apple account, sorry, Adobe, Apple, sorry, which one? Is it? Where you can download fonts, okay? It's Adobe, Apple, I'm not sure. Adobe, all of it. Adobe font thing, I, I don't use it too often, I already have all my fonts downloaded. But be considerate of your font selection, okay? It's important because as industrial designers, the, to correct me if I'm wrong, um, the, they also want to see some graphic design sensitivity and ability in you. And you should have some, right? And um, if, if you can, take a graphic design class while you're here at school, okay? If it's available to you. Um, super important to have an understanding of fonts, typeface, graphic composition, stuff like that. It'll help you. It's only going to make you better as an industrial designer because so much of what you do you, know, you look at the side of the shoe, you can't tell from 100 feet away what the materials are. All you're looking at are graphics. That's it. It's graphics. It's a color block. It's white down here, black up here, with a little red hit. So that's graphics. So you got to make sure your portfolio doesn't have to be like this masterpiece of graphic design. Okay? But it should be well thought out. Font selection, again, look at these websites, see how they lay things out. It should have a combination of, you know, photos of your final project. I would highly recommend, I'm always impressed when I see um, pictures of the prototypes being built in, in stages, right? Like I started here, because it shows, if you have an engineering aptitude, okay, mechanical aptitude, it shows your employer right away, like, oh, okay, he's like, he's into the craft. You know, he's into the, the mechanism and the engineering side. Because some of your companies might be more engineering heavy, and some might be more design heavy, or, you know, they, they might, more emphasis, more emphasis is on engineering or heavy math, understanding, okay. Okay, any questions up to this point? <laughs> what is your process? Do you sketch first and then design it and 3D models? And how do you show that? Okay, that's a good question. Okay, so he asked what my process is. So um, it depends on where I work, okay? If you're working in automotive, you literally just, you're a, you're a sketch monkey, okay? You just sketch all the time, okay? And you get really good, and you have to be really good. So you sketch a lot, okay? And then that sketch goes over, and then they do full size on these down walls of a tape drawing of a car. They'll take that sketch, put it in Illustrator, get some lines, print it off full size, and then um, and they'll start taping lines and taping new lines, okay? 
So in what I'm doing now, I go right from sketch to SolidWorks. And it's literally just a quick sketch, just so I know what the form is, okay? So, so why is, that's, uh, that's why, sketching nowadays, okay, that's what, we're glad you asked. Sketching nowadays is a lot different for industrial design than it was 20 years ago, okay? 20 years ago, you really had to be able to render stuff by hand. We were, I finished school right when we were kind of phasing that out and phasing in computer modeling and rendering capabilities. I mean, Photoshop was new, Illustrator was new, was Corel Draw before that. Does anyone know the word term Corel Draw? <laughs> 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 See, no one even knows what Corel Draw is. That's so funny. It's not <coughs> so, um, so, so now, when you communicate through sketching, it depends on where you work. If you work at a car company, yeah, you still have to be a rock star sketcher. Uh, if you're working at a shoe company, you still have to be a rock star sketcher because you're doing these beautiful Photoshop renderings, and it's all in Photoshop. Um, okay, so it depends. And for most industries, take cars out of it. I don't know how many people get into car design here, but. Uh, most industries, you're just sketching really quick. Uh, you know what the problem is. You're going, hey, we're just redesigning this trend now. Or we have, here's our Trek bike, or you know, here's our last season's model we're going to do. Or here's my Air Jordans, we did last year's. So um, you just start sketching ideas. I look at things, I have to look at images to get ideas to come in my head. Um, I close my eyes a lot, and a lot of times if you just you can kind of see forms and stuff develop and you just quickly sketch it. So sketching nowadays is more for you to, okay? And if you can't draw in 3D, it's, it's not going to help you design in 3D, okay? I'm not saying you have to be this prolific sketcher. That's not true. Because I know a guy who did the McLaren F1, he worked at Night for uh, His sketches were, <laughs> they're not good. They're not very good. What he's good at is the, digit, the, the sculpting in the 3D and understanding 3D form, okay? So that's another thing I suggest. If you can, take a sculpting class. You might think I'm crazy, but I'm not. Take a sculpting class. Uh, learn how to work with clay and shade away forms and see how things intersect, okay? Uh, we do that on the computer nowadays, digital sculpting, right? uh, But I think it's good to have the craft of the just having the clay right in front of you and stuff. Or use that as part of your process. Go get a lump of clay, and before you go into 3D, start sculpting away, carving it away. And uh, if you do that, you put that in your portfolio, man, that's like, I think that's huge. I think that's huge. So, okay. Okay. I, never, I didn't really have a plan. I just, I'm just flying by suit my pants right now. Any other questions? Yes. Did you negotiate your salaries at each of your jobs? <laughs> uh, yes. And then how did that process go? Did you did your expectations meet reality? Yeah. Um, yeah. Salary negotiation is a really tough. That's a that's a tough subject because um, here's the best advice I can give on salary salary negotiation: have one offer in hand and have two people going at it, okay? Because <laughs> if you can honestly say, hey, I have another offer for this, you don't even have to ask for more money. They'll just offer it. Okay. But you have to have another offer. That's the best advice I can give on salary. Okay. What would you say, Andrew, is that? Yeah, I mean, you have to know what you're worth. Yeah. And so, because I had some, I had one in Chicago, and they offered me like 75,000, I just scoffed at it, I'm like, why on earth would I want that? I'm like, well, it's, it's good. I'm like, tell me what's the average cost of a house. I'm like, uh, 500,000. <laughs> I'm like, so there's no way I'll ever, I'm like, you know, you gotta be real. Like, I've got offers of that same here in Utah that I can buy a home with. Like, I mean, it's just understanding. I mean, you obviously don't go in there cocky at all, but you're just like, hey, for this to work, it's, you're gonna have to do something. So sometimes you try not to throw out the number and let them throw out the number. Um, but sometimes you can get it to move, um, especially if you can sell what you're worth. So, I mean, usually we're talking maybe 10 to 15 percent 
ability to negotiate. Beyond that, you really have to have proven why you'd be worth a 20% bump above what they initially offered. And yeah. sometimes when you come back way too high, it's like, yeah, you, know, you obviously think you're worth way too much, things like that. So, and then just know what the positions are going for. Like, you know what an entry-level fashion designer is getting paid. You know what an entry-level product designer is getting paid. We'll talk about that in the advance of uh, that seminar. When we talk about career readiness, I bring in a few off the letters that I've had. Negotiating vacation, negotiating all that stuff. So. Thank you. Uh, what I will say on, on that too is the, the younger you are, fresh out of, out of school, um, the harder it is to negotiate. Okay? As, you, as you've been in your career for 15 years, you, you get a sense for what you're, what you're worth and what you're going to make, and so will your new boss. So they're not going to be low-balling you, I promise you. After you've got 20 years in, they know, hey, this is what you can command, and that's it. And you don't have to be desperate. So I was just looking at the, so part of your portfolio should be your, your sketchbook, like pages from your sketchbook. Take pictures of it, okay? And um, this is, I was just looking at a sketchbook, this is really good. Got a lot of cool stuff in here. Shoe concepts. Okay. Um, but this is, this is how you get better at design uh, is, is through sketching and through ideating. Okay. Um, so yeah, keep, keep your sketchbook uh, going, ongoing, and keep adding content to it. Okay, so we talked about the portfolio, we talked about fonts and typefaces. Oh, the other thing about fonts really quick is before I forget. You guys know what kerning is? Ker kerning is a spacing between each letter, okay? And you can only do it in Illustrator. Make sure you kern your typeface. Most, most fonts are spaced out too far, okay? So like the B and the E, the space in between there, that's the kern. And most, by default, are too far apart. And if you don't bring it in, it's the first thing Someone will go, he doesn't know about graphic design, he doesn't know about fonts, he doesn't know about typeface, okay? It's instant, you know, okay? So make sure you have a graphic designer, not design it for you, but look over your stuff and get their opinion, okay? Because they, they have different sensitivities. So, so you're presenting, so as you present yourself, you guys raise hands if you have questions, okay? Um, as you, you're trying to sell your, yourself in every, you, you don't want to show any weaknesses in design, okay? And graphics is part of that. So make sure you really think about the graphic side, of it, okay? And again, do it on your own, but have a graphic designer or someone trained to give you suggestions, okay? Or another industrial designer who has a lot of them. Yes? Can you um, talk about white space for a minute? White space? Just how do you use it, utilize it? What do you think? I don't know. Oh, you're talking this? This white space? Yeah. Okay. Um, in what way, in what context? Text? Um, just like when you're laying out a page, I guess. Mm -hmm. you, I don't know. Because we had a um, graphic design and we just spoke on white space for people. Okay. Uh, it's, it's important. <laughs> you don't want to crowd the borders, the, the general rules. You don't want to crowd the borders of your page. Okay. Keep the borders free of debris. Okay. So give yourself a, a boundary and just maintain that boundary. So that's that's what I'd say about white space. All right, so, yeah. 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 Don't keep keep everything, you know, nicely contained. You know, on this on this website, you know, there is a there's a boundary here, right, that's respected. And most websites are like that. Even on this page they have a, a boundary that's respected. Don't, you never want to put things too far to the edge of the border, so keep it clean, okay? And hopefully this is, okay. Um, is this thing still magnifying my way? Question right here. Yes. So, I mean, separating the portfolio needs of the program, but more looking at like a professional portfolio. For those of us interested in going product development, I mean, 
what specifically maybe could we put in our portfolio that would maybe show our aptitude towards product development, not necessarily strictly design. Okay. Um, you guys, is SolidWorks kind of mandatory? Yeah. That's part of the program? Yeah. Are there any other 3D programs or is that the main one? SolidWorks, Keyshot, Rhino. Okay, okay, yeah, those are, those are the three big ones. So, yeah, I would, I would show, uh, as a developer, your, uh, your work with factories, you're kind of the go between, between the designer and the factory, getting stuff made, uh, or the, yeah, develop, development role usually is strictly because there's an Asian or, or an international factory and if it's all in-house, done in-house, you don't need developers really, because the designer can work with the model shop and the engineer. And the engineer really is the developer. So mechanical engineer, so at ICON it goes, we hand it off, I go, here's my design, it's 90% accurate, just the exterior. And then the engineer takes it and he becomes the developer. He's making it for production. So mechanical engineers by default become developers. Um, I would, I would say, yeah, really get a good mastery of SolidWorks, and um, you know, you, you do need to be able to sketch a little, but not prolifically like Zyphon might. But um, and then showcase your mechanical aptitude. You know, showcase how you build things and how you engineer things. So instead of just styling and solving a an aesthetic problem or a functional problem. Okay. Is that? Yeah, that's not that help? Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Well, I'll give me a break. To... You guys gotta have some questions. I can keep just talking. That's fine. I don't mind silence. I'll wait. <laughs> I'm not scared of silence. Ah, question. I like this one. What would you do differently if you were in our shoes getting ready to go out? That's a good question. It's a good question. Um, I would probably have, uh, I probably would have talked with or, you know, kind of got a graphic designer to evaluate the graphics of things, not a huge deal, um, and probably would have done more research like this, but web sites were still in their infancy, so design firms weren't even using the web when I was, well, they were just starting to, <coughs> so um, I guess, yeah, I just maybe, yeah, talk to some, uh, well, get a graphic designer, look over things, like I said. And then um, just make sure that you have clear, oh, here's what I do. Make sure that each, each project you have, okay, that you have in your portfolio, um, it needs to, however you show your problem statement, your solution, your, your iteration sketches and ideation sketches, follow that same format and do not change the graphics from page to page. It will confuse someone. Pick a template, use the template, and then stick to it. So don't do a blue page here with cool line graphics and then a, a green page here with swirly lines and uh-uh, don't do that. It's gotta be consistent, okay? And your storytelling and, and how you format things has to be consistent, not just the graphic design, okay? I'm talking a little bit too much about graphic design, but it, it, is, it is important, okay? Um, okay. All right. Yes? Do you, in your career, do you tailor your portfolio to a specific job you're trying to get, or you put more of a general, uh, more of a portfolio for the job? Yeah, you should, you should tailor. You should tailor, yeah. Um, if you want to do footwear, you, you've got to have mostly footwear projects. I wouldn't even, you could show some other projects, but they're probably not even going to care, honestly, because <laughs> the footwear guys are so specific, so niche, and you know, car guys are like that. Um, you know, also, uh, if you want to do boats or you know, watercraft, 
you, know, you have to have those because they have to see something in there that relates to what they are working on. And they have to be able to go, okay, here's what he's done, here's what we do as a company. Do I see, what was your name? Ben. 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 Do I see Ben getting from here to here in six months? Okay. What's his ramp up going to be? You know, they, they know you're not going to have the, the skills and abilities as senior designers, more veteran, veteran designers. But they're looking for, okay, you got to show them the, the same projects you'd be working on there. You have to. Okay? Um, it's very rare that you can not have any portfolio pieces related to the job you're going to be looking for. And here's what I'd suggest. If your school doesn't provide you the project, because they can't, they can't possibly provide you all the studio projects that you're going to need to customize for your personal career when there's hundreds of you, okay? Just do them on your own. Find a, a project, create your own, create your own product. If you're into watches, do some new cool watches, you know, come up with a story and and do a little research, say, hey, I know some people are running, and you know, they look here, it's, you know, maybe, I don't know, just come up with something, okay? But uh, as you watch people do things, you learn a lot, right? Let me, just, let me talk about that for just a quick second. So, observational methods, okay? Observational methods have been around for a long time, like, Raymond Lowy days, okay? Raymond Lowy is like the steam, the, the, the bullet train designer, okay, back 60 years ago, okay? One of the pioneers of industrial design. And, um, but he was big into observing people, using products and stuff like that. And, you know, if you're ironing, people would step on the leg to balance the iron, okay? It's called compensatory behavior compensating for a, fe a weakness in the product, okay, by doing something that, okay. So, so if you can find those types of things and observe, um, you can put little things like that in your portfolio that shows that you're thinking about it. And so, yeah. Okay, does that help? Does that answer? Yes, thanks. Okay, so the answer is yes. You want to make sure you have relatable projects. Do you find that, uh, so you worked the past 20, 30 years, how long would you say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, right about there. It's been about 25 years. Yeah. So well, do 20, you yeah. find design is impacted by the socioeconomic conditions of the day, or does your, com does your company influence the design? Or like, is it user-based influence versus company top-down? approach to design. Did the recession have an impact on design? Uh, okay, that's a good question. Good question. Okay, so how does, okay, okay restate that one more time. Just so I'm sure. Let's just examine the recession. Did the recession have an impact so, on the resource materials that you put into your designs? Okay, so I would, I would say what are the current cultural <coughs> trends? Right. Okay, they can be economic. Uh, they can be uh, environmental, okay? That's one thing I would add right now, uh, is if you can get some environmental ideas in your, that's pretty huge right now, it's pretty popular, like how we can help you run and stuff like that. So companies are looking for that. But, um, so, uh, I don't know if I'm gonna answer your question right away. <laughs> but I would just say, yeah, there's, there's things that are relevant today that were not relevant. And 20 years ago, and you should, but you guys are kind of, I think, just subconsciously aware of those things because we live in it today. And so I don't think we have to invent new, you know, things, but, um, yeah, so. How often are you having to reinvent yourself as a designer? Uh, reinvent myself. Um, I'm always trying to look for new ways to become better and become more efficient. Um, so, uh, but I like who I am, so I'm not trying to reinvent myself. <laughs> okay. But I am looking for better processes. Can I, can I get better where I'm looking for my weaknesses, right? And as you do more things, you'll uncover more weaknesses, but you'll also uncover more strengths. 
because you tried something you didn't know. Okay. One of the things I noticed with designers starting out is, um, how are we doing on time here? Uh, okay, I'll wrap up here. Um, is an unwillingness to kind of showcase sketches or show your work, okay, or show an idea, okay. You, you have to get past that fear, okay. One of the great quotes by Michael Jordan was, you will miss 100% of the shots you take. Okay. So if you don't try to show, you just, you'll fail for sure. So um, I would just say, be courageous. Don't be afraid to show what you have. All you can do is show what you have, OK? OK. Is this over 12.50 or what? <laughs> Sorry. Any other questions? Any other last <laughs> we have three minutes. All right, let's give Chris a hand in.